And now, the survival show which once survived a spelling bee for exactly one round. In this episode, we go back one more time into the vault for homeschooling, part two with the Davises. Howdy, and welcome to In the Rabbit Hole's Urban Survival Podcast. This is episode number 187. I'm your host, Aaron, and you are in the rabbit hole. Safe and sound. Before we get started, this is, of course, a rebroadcast of episode 79. We were going to do a fresh episode this week, but so many of you wrote in asking for part two to be replayed. So, well, here it is. Remastered and reloaded for your listening pleasure. Next week, we will be getting loopy on some homemade mead with Michael Jordan in the zombie apocalypse. But now for the Davises, part two. I gotta say, I'm very excited today. We are with Serena and Ron Davis once more to cover homeschooling, which was such a popular show last time, which we were joking about a little bit before the show. Uh, I was actually really excited to see people be so into homeschooling and have such a positive reaction. Uh, because I know a lot of people have the preconceived notion that we talked about last time of homeschooling's weird. But it's well, not, I think is it? Prepping's a little weird, too. No. <laughs> Or at least that's the, the same people have the same concept. That, that's very true. But I think it's interesting. I mean, we are definitely, I'm watching, as I watch the news more and more, I see people talking about homeschooling more and more. And it seemed, it's become almost more acceptable than I think it was, especially when I was in high school. We will not talk about how long ago that was for any of us. So what do you got for us today? Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, a couple of things, but one was homeschool myths, which I think we talked about a bit. Mm -hmm. The main one is socialization. Mm -hmm. How are your kids going to be socialized? You know, and the idea is they have to be around kids their own age to be adequately socialized. Mm -hmm. But until they're 10, the most important person in their life, according to psychologists, is their parents. Mm -hmm. And after 10, it's their peers. If you're homeschooling, you can control who their peers are. <laughs> if you're not homeschooling, you cannot. This is true. So even though, even in homeschooling, if they have um, connection with their peers, their peers do become more important than the parents. They still can be careful. You can still be careful about who they can hang out with. Socialization, basically, you can get that anywhere. You can get it at church. You can get it by going to conferences. You can get it at um, by going to stuff like Maker Fair, and you know having your kid do things in the booth, learning how to put a Arduino together, or making a some kind of box with saws, etc. You you don't have to have socialization of eight hours a day with thirty two kids and one teacher. Um, another homeschool myth is, and I've heard this from people who don't homeschool, but I assume that other homeschoolers have heard it too, is they watch the spelling bee and the winner's a homeschool student and they're like, oh, of course, of course the winner's a homeschool student. That's all they do is practice spelling because they're <laughs> going to be in the national spelling bee. And that's not true. I mean, yes, as a homeschooler, you can say, okay, you're interested in science, let's do more science. Mm -hmm. Or you're interested in poetry, Let's go read some different poets and some different kinds of poetry and work on, you know, making um, English and Petrarchan sonnets. But they don't just study spelling. They study everything. Um, even in Texas, you can't just study spelling. And Texas is as hands-off on homeschooling as you can get. Is it really? I yes. didn't. Okay. They require that you have curriculum for five subjects. Mm. That's it. You don't have to use the curriculum. <laughs> you just have to have it. You them. just have to have it. Those subjects are, don't even include science. It's math, grammar, reading, spelling, and citizenship. Citizenship. Yes. That's glad. I'm, I'm actually glad to hear that that's still part of the curriculum, and I hope that's... Well, it's the homeschoolers it, have to do it. <laughs> the public schools have to teach citizenship, and if they did, so. what would that be? Yeah, I guess Ed, that that is an open-ended discussion on what is citizenship. Yeah, because I guess that 
Not to get into a political discussion. Well, but. most schools consider it social studies. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a policeman is your friend when you're a little kid. <laughs> and then who is your community? Yeah. And then your state history and government or citizenship. And that's pretty much what most people buy the books for when they're looking for the curriculum in Texas. But we don't have to keep a record of how many days we study. We don't have to keep a record of how many hours we study. We don't have to keep a record of what books we use. We don't have to keep a record of tests the kids have taken. Mm -hmm. We don't have to take any exams, state, national, general. But that does beg the question. I I know people are thinking right now, well, then what is to hold parents accountable for actually making sure their children are educated. And that is one of the other (laughs) myths because a lot of people see in the news, well, here's this family with five kids, and they homeschooled them all by taking them out and making the oldest, who was 12, watch the other four. And then the mom and dad went to work. Mm. And so they didn't get caught or nobody knew anything until all five kids you know, we're in trouble or starved to death or we're seen wearing the same clothes five weeks in a row or um, whatever. And so a lot of people think that that lack of accountability is common in homeschooling. Mm. That parents don't, you know what though? 90%, 99% of people are way more concerned about their kids than they are about anybody else. I would, I would, uh, I could definitely see that. I don't have any kids that I'm aware of, but I could see that. And... Anybody who is committed to homeschooling Mm -hmm. is making a huge financial, emotional, and time commitment. Yes, there are a couple of weirdos out there, just like there are a couple of murderers out there, but most people don't murder. Yeah. I would say that the bad homeschoolers are probably less common Mm -hmm. than bad people in general. Just thinking through, I mean, on the surface, of course, we we had the question a second ago, which is how do you make sure that they're that the parents are actually doing what they're supposed to. and then, But on the flip side of that, you raised an interesting point, which is that it actually would be a lot easier to tell your kids, get your asses on the buses and get, your, get yourselves yeah. to school than it would be to say, oh, we're homeschooling, kids do whatever you want. Yes. I mean, right. if I didn't want to be bothered with my children, I'd say, walk your happy butts down to the bus stop, get on the bus and get to school. And when it's time to come home, do the reverse. Yes, it is a lot easier mm-hmm. to send them to public school. Yeah, and the other thing school. is, when you go to public school, who holds the parents accountable for doing what they're supposed to do? Yeah, nobody. I mean, nobody, that's a major problem. Because now the parents aren't supposed to do anything except get them to go to school. Mm-hmm. What is this accountability thing that you speak of? From and do we want the government to give it to us? But once again, <laughs> and we don't, and that's why Texas is great. Yeah. North Carolina, for instance, where I've also lived, requires a certain number of hours in class every day. Mm-hmm a certain definition of class hours, a certain number of days per year in class, a list of the books you're actually using, anything they've read for, like, English. They have to take not only standardized national exams, but also standardized state exams. It has to be filed every year. Mm. Social workers and the principal can come visit you in their house, Mm. you know, as part of the whatever. They don't normally, but they can. Yeah. And I don't think Texas has any less qualified, working hard, homeschool parents than North Carolina does. Mm-hmm. But in Texas, the government's not in your face about it. And I like that. It's why I live in Texas and mm-hmm. not North Carolina. <laughs> One of the reasons. <laughs> in terms of parent accountability, something you said made me think, well, how do you know if you're doing the right thing? I think it's much more likely that the parents are overly worried. Like, I don't want to be a homeschooler because what if I do something wrong? What if I permanently scar my children? What if I don't know how to teach reading? What if my kids can't learn math? And I know that because I did that. (laughs) (laughs) And then afterwards, you're like, oh, I could have done that better, and I could have done that better, and I could have... Yes, that's true, too. But it's also true in public schooling. Mm -hmm. And at least in homeschooling, you can control it, you can see it, and you can go, okay, I don't know how to do this. What do I have to do to figure out how to do that or to get my kid to learn it even though I don't know how to do it? Mm -hmm. So, for instance, I wasn't very good at math and I was really good at English. Hey, I have a PhD in English, so I'm really good at English. It stands to reason, yeah. But the last time I was good at math was like 10th grade algebra. Mm -hmm. And so I was really concerned about my boys knowing math. 
So when they were little, we used to spend a lot of time doing puzzles, which is part of math. And we would count steps going up the steps to the apartment. And we would count things. How many red cars can you see, you know, out the window while we're driving? And um, when we were at the grocery store, okay, if this is $4 and this is $7 and I have $10, is that enough money to buy these two things? And I actually concentrated on math so much that I'd kind of discovered eventually that I hadn't really been focusing on English as much as I should have. <laughs> and I went, oh, oh, yeah. I mean, I hadn't ignored it. I had taught them to read, and, mm-hmm. and we read together and whatever. But I finally realized that, yes, we had the basics in math down, and they were way ahead in math. And now I needed to make sure they stayed up to date and ahead in English. So. Mm-hmm. So a lot of parents are so worried about, I don't know how to do it. I don't know what to do. That that, that accountability thing, I think, is actually flip. Mm-hmm. It's more likely they won't homeschool because they're afraid of not being good at it. Yeah, and I think uh, the few people that I've talked to that don't know anything about it, that is one of their first concerns is, I don't know how to teach. I, you know, I'm not qualified to, to go through. I, I mean, how many... I, Aside from you, how many of us are actually qualified to teach even junior high English? I mean, most people I know can barely spell anymore. Now, in my defense, I've never been able to spell, and I have a doctor's note, but <laughs> most, people, most people really get out into the world, and most of what they've learned just kind of goes out there. And as far as technical skills that we pick up in grammar school and high school, most of that goes out our brains, unless it is what we do as a living. Um, and so... I think that is a big concern for a lot of people. How I, I, you know, I can't cover all of these subjects as an individual, and how do I, how do I actually teach these children in the, in a more formal setting? Um, well, that's two questions. I'm going to go with the first one. I yeah. guess the second one a little bit because it's on my list. But in terms of teaching, most education majors have two classes in education, and for high, for elementary school teachers that consists, one of those is a big part putting together bulletin boards and speaking clearly and correctly. Uh, I've I, been in those classes. I have to stop for a second. Putting together bulletin boards? Yes, because of the design issues and making sure you can do that. So that's like your major pro- one of your major product projects in that class. Elementary school bulletin boards, the design is of a concern? Apparently. Okay. Sarcasm sold separately there. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. I'm, I'm serious. That, I mean, we did. And they also would do, um, they do film videos of you teaching the class how to do something so you could see if you were saying um too much or if you were um, ignoring one part of the room over another part of the room. And that was very useful if you have a class of 32 kids. Mm-hmm. But you, it also teaches you to stand in one place. Mm-hmm. If you have a class of 32 kids, shouldn't you be moving around? You know, the most engaging, <laughs> one of the most engaging teachers that I ever had actually was a, a college professor. We had him on the show a very long time ago. And, and the only history class where I ever actually paid attention to every minute of every class. And part of it was because it was, what is this maniac going to do next? Because he was <laughs> moving all over the room and he was acting out uh, portions of of uh, early American history, which also entailed him climbing on desks from time to time. <laughs> sometimes it was his desk. Sometimes it was the desk of a student. So, yeah, that's being that that perfectly poised public speaker is not terribly engaging for children, I would imagine. Nor do children really care how often you do the ums and the uhs and the that stuff. And besides all that, most elementary school stuff, anybody can do. I mean, mm. assuming you don't have a significant disability, Mm -hmm. and assuming you have any kind of education, you can read, you can write, you can use a dictionary and look up how to spell words you don't know, Mm -hmm. or as one brilliant man I once knew, kept a list of words he didn't know how to spell next to his computer, so whenever he had to spell them, he could just spell check with his list. And I have a PhD in English, and there's there were until the last five years, two words I did not know how to spell. I couldn't spell them. I always had to look them up. Mm-hmm. So it's not like spelling is going to kill you if you look it up in the dictionary mm-hmm. or online in the dictionary. But in terms of science, you could do cooking. Mm-hmm. We watched Miss Frizzle all the time. Okay? The magic school bus. <laughs> <laughs> and we learned a lot of science mm-hmm. from Miss Frizzle. And people still learn science from Miss Frizzle. Mm-hmm. Do they? Re- yeah. I'm actually not even familiar with the show. And what he means is, what is the Magic School Bus? Oh. Yeah, that's what, that's, I don't the even Magic know what it is. Magic School Bus is an animated show. It was on PBS, right? 
or was it on something else? I don't, I don't remember. Know. But Miss um, Frizzle was the kid's science teacher, and she had a magic school bus, and they would get in the school bus, and then they would, you know, go to volcanoes. Biology, they go inside a bo- you know, body, oh. or if they were studying volcanoes, they'd go inside a volcano, you know, and so you could learn all this stuff. Oh, okay. They did and, the salmon runs, and yeah. So um, it was, yeah, it was a fun and engaging way to learn science, and so we watched a lot of that. I remember a lot of Miss Frizzle. But yeah, cooking, I mean, that's a very, that is, there's a tremendous amount of chemistry. I mean, my brother was a professional pastry chef for quite some time, and he said, oh yeah, it's not, it, there's flair and dazzle involved, but it's really about chemistry. Well, and also for things like that, okay, say I'm a lousy cook and I don't know about chemistry and cooking. Mm-hmm. Well, Harvard offers a free class. You can go get the book, read it, and then figure out how to translate it for your first and second and third and fourth grade kids, mm-hmm. you know, that you have at home. So there are stuff I didn't know that I went and learned so that I could teach my kids. Mm -hmm. And my kids would occasionally ask me a question and I'd go, I don't know. And they'd think it was because they didn't, I didn't understand the question. So they'd rephrase it. And I'd say, I still don't know. (laughs) And they'd say it some other way. And I'm like, I don't know. We can look it up, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I find that. Like where babies come from? Yeah. (laughs) Oh, that one. Yeah. Did we say that story already? No, I don't think we did. We have. The weirdest, where did kids, kids where did asking where did babies from? come from? So my kids said, so mom, I don't remember. Maybe it was, how do babies, where do how babies, babies come made. from? How are babies, babies made? That's it. Mm-hmm. Ron was supposed to give them that story, that, that discussion. And so I said, <laughs> well, why don't you ask your dad? And we were in the car driving and dad was at work and not going to be home for hours. And they're like, mom, come on, you're a grown up. You can tell us. I think they were like five and six. Okay. Mm. And I said, um, well, well, what do you want to know? Well, I want to know where babies come from or how babies are made. And I'm like, okay, well, and I'm trying, I mean, we always used um, anatomically correct words, mm-hmm. which freaked my parents out. You know, my son would go, I have an itch on my penis. Well, you ah! did try to, you, you know, when you're telling that story to kids, there's stages, you know, you, right. you no, can I'm answer, not- oh. Yeah, okay. And so I said, well, um, the mom and dad love each other, and they sleep together, and then the babies make. No, mom, I know that. I mean, where? <laughs> how do babies get made? I'm like, um, well, men and women are made differently biologically, and they go together, like um, putting a top on a soda uh, water bottle, and they're like. Mom, really, <laughs> where do babies come from? By this time, I'm flustered, you know, because I wasn't really thinking this would come up quite so Yeah, early. you weren't quite ready for that awkward <laughs> conversation. And um, we're in the car, and I'm trying to think really fast. And so finally, I'm like, well, the, the father has a vagina, a uh, penis, and the mother, <laughs> and I probably did say that. <laughs> and the mother has a vagina, and they go together, and the sperm ejaculates, and the the Sperm goes up to the egg and fertilizes the egg, and a baby's created. And they went, Mom, what I wanted to know is, how does the DNA from the sperm (laughs) match up with the DNA in the egg and know how to create a baby and not two people? So at five and six, they're asking this really technical question, and you're you're dancing around the more socially delicate aspects of the conversation. (laughs) And that's the kind of question you will get, and you will be flustered, and mm-hmm. you'll go, oh, "Well, if I didn't know that, I would have <laughs> answered that thirty minutes ago." You know, but I don't know. Would have been the answer. But... <laughs> I don't know. Um, we'll look it up. That's right. So, what are some of the other myths? I know we we dug into a few so far. What are some of the other ones that? Um, well, one is that homeschool kids aren't as well educated mm-hmm. because a parent can't know everything. Right. And um, that's a myth because. A parent can't know everything, but one parent concerned with one or two or even five kids can know anything that's important for those kids. Mm -hmm. Whereas one teacher with 32 kids or even worse, junior high, 150 kids, cannot know what the students don't know, what they need to know, where they got lost on that last presentation or that last whatever. Um, And so in general, based on testing national testing and otherwise, um, homeschool students are actually better educated than public school students. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, it's not a big issue to the public media Mm -hmm. because they're public 
oriented and most people's kids are in public schools, so they don't tend to talk about it. But one example to show that that is accurate is that a lot of school or some colleges will let in homeschoolers automatically. Mm -hmm. They qualify as top 10% of their class and Mm -hmm. they are automatically admitted to college. That's interesting. In states that have the automatic admission. See, in the state of Texas, if you finish in the top 10% of your class, you're guaranteed to get into a state university. You're guaranteed to be admitted to a state university, which actually puts kids at really good schools at a disadvantage. Yeah. Because they may be smarter than the 10% at another school, but they finish 12 at their super school. But homeschoolers, since they weren't part of a class, how does that work for them? Because they're the bottom, the top, and the middle half of yeah. their school. So what does that do? Well, A&M, for example, Texas A&M admits you automatically as a homeschooler. Oh, okay. So, um, I don't know. There's so many Aggie jokes out there. That... <laughs> and then I want to talk about what school is. Because mm-hmm. we think of school, especially I was public school. Were you public school? No, I was private. I, I think I went to public school for a year. All right. So <laughs> we think of public school, maybe private school too, is lines of desks. Mm -hmm. Like the Industrial Revolution, you know, you need all the cogs in a row Mm -hmm. to work. So all the desks are lined up. The teacher's at the front of the room. A teacher who climbs on desks is weird and unusual and anomaly that you actually pay attention to. Yes, all of those things, but yeah. Um, And yet a normal class has the teacher at the very front, like there's a glass pane between her and the classroom or him and the classroom. Mm -hmm. And the students are all in a row. They're not supposed to turn around. They're not supposed to pass notes. They're supposed to do their work, and then sit at the desk waiting for everyone to finish. And then you move all together like you're one organism to the next thing, and then you sit there while everybody else is working on their stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's what we think of homeschooling as, too, because that's what we know. Mm -hmm. So you start out and you go, oh, my goodness, I don't have room in my house for a desk. You know, I need a teacher desk. I, I did this, okay, and I knew better. I need a teacher desk, and I need student desks, and I need space for me to walk up and down the aisle like my two kids are going to need an aisle. And a writing crop, because now you're at home, you can actually beat them. No, no, as a ruler. Oh, yeah, well, that's a ruler. Ruler. Um, So y'all were doing the parochial thing is what you're talking about. Yeah, no, well, my teacher must have been parochial in second grade, (laughs) although it was public school. (laughs) But it it was a ruler in second grade that smacked me. Uh, Um, But that's not really what school is. Mm-hmm. I mean, I talked about a little doing the grocery store and doing the right. climbing steps, doing puzzles. Math and music are related. If you're good yeah. at math, you're good at music. If you're good at music, you're good at math. So, singing in the car, learning to play some kind of instrument, listening to a concert, all of that is school for math. Mm-hmm. How many kids who really don't like math would have loved math? If they'd have been told, well, you could do a thousand-piece puzzle as part of your... Really? That's math? You can sit and listen to Handel's Messiah. That's math? You can learn to play the ukulele. That's math? Well, no, it's not. But Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's related enough that it will help you with math. And so you can go to an accordion contest as part of your math class and your music class. You know, you can do all kinds of things. For science, you can cook, Mm -hmm. you can hike, and have do a botany class where you identify the plants and the. You can start with you know this is a pine, this is a live oak, this is a cypress, this is a cedar, this is a mesquite. I'm moving from Houston to Abilene, so (laughs) there's a difference in trees. Okay, Um, and pretty soon the kids will you'll ask them, well, what is this? And they'll go, that's a live oak. What is this? That's a pine, and then you can start. Okay, here's two leaves. Which one's the live oak? Mm -hmm. Which one's the Schumard oak? How do you know? Which one loses its leaves in the wintertime? Why? What's different about the live oak and the Schumard oak? You know, do you just talk about the trees? And you can learn about the trees yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't have to know all that. And remember, I don't know if you did. We did leaf collections Mm -hmm. way back in the day. It was like fourth or fifth grade. We always had leaf collections, and whoever had the most leaves identified correctly. And did the teacher know all the leaves in those? No. She'd see a leaf labeled lavender, and she'd go look up what a lavender leaf looked like. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was, yes, you know. If you're exploring, like Kingwood has trails that go for miles and miles and miles with forest around them, you can find a lot of different kind of leaves in there. Mm -hmm. Well, 
You don't have to put them in a box. Have your kid go, okay, what's that plant? What's that plant? What's that plant? Then in the fall, go through and collect leaves and go, okay, which ones go with which trees? You can do a lot like that. Um, So you can be extremely creative and it sounds like, and it also sounds like, you know, those were the outings that you're talking about are the field trips that most other kids get so excited about in public school because it's, I'm going to be let out into the world and, and actually get to see things and do something that's engaging instead of the most boring thing on the planet to a child, especially an intelligent, a truly intelligent child, which is to sit, in, sit there and be spoon fed in an extremely boring fashion information yes. and expected to just basically memorize it and then turn around and regurgitate it. Yeah, my, my oldest um, was a victim of private school first grade because mm-hmm. I was too afraid to do homeschooling. And his brother wanted to go to public school, and he goes, really? Really? Do you know what you do all day? You do your work, and then you sit there and wait. It's just wait and then line up. Wait and then line up. Wait and then line up. You don't get to do anything at all mm-hmm. because you get your work done, and nobody else has theirs done, but you can't read, you can't do something else, and you get in trouble if you fidget. <laughs> that was first grade. Yeah. First grade, you know, where you normally think of the really sweet teachers who love the kids, and they bring, you know, cupcakes for your birthday. Nah. <laughs> Sit, wait, get in line, wait, be quiet. Yeah. Um, and that's really is a lot of it. Mm-hmm. And then p- how many field trips can I do? They don't have to be... Field trips where you know stuff. Do the school field trips. I mean, not with the school. Right. Go to the Renaissance Festival on mm-hmm. on the school day. Read up a little bit. Get some books out of the library for your kids to read. Night stories. They have, you know, it doesn't have to be a grown up book. Mm-hmm. For even for you, Discovery uh, Esborn has some really good books on the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. And since the Renaissance Fair covers the whole, you know, <laughs> from one thousand to 1900 any of those ages would work <laughs> yeah. and, and read through them and and then say okay here's what we're going to do we're going to play i spy or we're going to play um where's waldo mm. we're going to look for these five things and see how many of them we can find so how much chain mail can we see how many actually renaissance ladies hats can we find mm. how you know whatever pick three things or five things and or have the kids you don't really want to separate the kids and, and then have them compete because then if something like chain mail shows up a lot and something else like ladies' hats doesn't, the kids are upset. But you could go, okay, we're going to do accurate for medieval and accurate men's and accurate for medieval women's. Mm-hmm. So we're going to look for these two things for men and these two things for women and see how many we find. And then come home and talk about it. Why was, was this more common than that? What, what kinds of things did we see made out of chain mail? Is that the kind of thing that would have really been made out of chain mail? And so you can go to the Renaissance Festival. You can go to their Natural History Museum. Mm-hmm. You can go to the Natural History Museum like every two months because they're always changing stuff. Yeah. And if you join, they have all the stuff for teachers and class lessons. And so, <laughs> oh, do they really? Yeah, I didn't know site. that. That, can, that makes sense, though. I, I guess a lot of museums would do something yeah, like that. Yeah, and you go to the site and you get the information and then you go... Learn it, you know, you look at it. This is what the teacher needs to know. Okay, mm. I learned that. And then you go with your kids and show them what is at the museum and let mm. them learn that way. So what are some other myths? You can't get into college. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely. Uh, but and, and I think we've covered that a couple of times. We're talking yeah, about, and I mean, that's really, I think we mentioned it in the last one. It's kind of we're standing on the shoulders of giants. That was true, but. Over the years, enough people have pioneered and gone through the homeschooling and applied to colleges and dealt with the ignorance, you know, dealt with what college people didn't know about it and worked through that and homeschoolers have gone through colleges and excelled. And so, you know, that's the kind of thing universities look for. They want to take in students that are going to finish and make the university look good. Mm-hmm. Homeschoolers were an unknown. Now they look and say, oh, all these homeschool kids that we had turned out great, so we want to recruit more of them. So nowadays, it's every major university is going to have, and even minor colleges, universities, it's going to have a protocol for handling homeschoolers. Mm-hmm. And that's the difference from the homeschool myth part. Homeschoolers think, oh, it'll be easy to get into college. It's not hard anymore. And that's true. It's not as hard anymore. But there are still level one colleges where all they require is 
what anyone else is required, mm -hmm. and level two colleges that require more mm -hmm. than what everybody else is required. My son wanted to be an actuarial scientist. Mm -hmm. Okay, he wanted to be an insurance risk adjuster. So we looked up what colleges in the United States offered actuarial science degrees. Mm -hmm. And then we looked up what the requirements were for freshmen who were homeschooled. And then we eliminated everyone that wasn't, yes, we'll take you at the same level as everyone else. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, we found some states he didn't want to go to. Well, I remember he originally wanted to go to the Wharton Business School because that was considered the number one actuarial school at the time. And we just determined that he wasn't going to be able to qualify, which was kind of lucky because it was going to be hideously expensive. But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say Wharton's not cheap. Right. But then we looked at schools in Texas, and he applied to the University of Texas and was accepted. But that wasn't, was that a rubber stamp? Because it wasn't a top 10% at UT, right? No. They let Elijah into UT because he had 72 hours of dual credit. And one of the ways that colleges are rated on quality or whatever is how many of your students get through in four years. And the average college student is now taking six. Mm. Wow. So they thought 42, 72 hours, no matter what he does, he's going to get out in four. That's going to bring our rate down. Yeah. And he's getting out in three and a half, so mm -hmm. he's bringing the rate down. Hmm. So, I mean, I don't know for sure that's what it was, but if I'd been in admissions, that would have been what I was Yeah, and at. also, yeah, I mean, they can look at it and say, well, the kid's gone to college. He's 18 it and has 72 hours of college. There's a difference, you know, between going to Lone Star College, community college, and going to the University of Texas at Austin. Yes, and he's going to have to make some adjustments, but he's already done a lot of college stuff, so he's probably going to be a successful student. And he's got a good grades. And he's used to dealing with the experience of going mm -hmm. to college, which is most kids coming out of high school have no clue what college is like. Now, the high school I went to was actually set up as a college preparatory school, so your classes and everything, minus the amount of people in your class, was structured to mimic college mm -hmm. so that you were used to it by the time you got there, right. which the founders of the school I went to, long story short, but they, that was one of the things they felt was missing in, in education in general. But uh, that also really depends on whether or not the kid's going off to college, which isn't always necessarily uh, yeah. the right decision. But more to the point of, yeah, I mean, I could definitely see where a college looks at it and says, wow, this kid's 18. He's already cleared 72 hours. We've got 22-year-olds that are having a trouble clearing 72 hours. So, I mean, that I definitely mean, makes sense. We have sense. A, a good friend. We worked with her parents in the homeschooling co-op we were in. And he, last year, year before last, graduated from the Air Force Academy. Mm -hmm. So he was homeschooled his entire life, and he was able to get into the Air Force Academy, about as competitive as it can get to get into a military academy. And so it's not impossible to get in. You're not going to get rubber stamped, but it doesn't hurt you any longer to be in homeschool. Right. And, th and that's the difference. I, when Elijah was looking at colleges, I don't want to jump through all these hoops. Here's mm -hmm. the schools that won't make us jump through more than everybody else. Right. Part of that was because I knew his education was good, and part of it was because some of that stuff, one of the colleges, I don't remember which one, I could look it up, but one of the colleges wanted every school book we had used since sixth grade. Oh, wow. Now, even if you were in a public school, mm -hmm. could you have listed every school book you've used in the last six years? No, absolutely not. And not only did I have to list the ones we used at home, which I mostly probably had around, mm -hmm. I had to list all the ones he used in college, too, mm -hmm. which were not around. Yeah. And so I was like, I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. I can't. I don't want to. And nothing. It's not worth it unless you can't get in anywhere else, which is not going to be an issue. So right. blow that one off. And I, if, as far as myths that homeschoolers have, I didn't know we had to keep a transcript. I'm sure everyone else never considered that a transcript. <laughs> but like North Carolina requires it. Oh, okay. So they if we're have talking about North every, Carolina. Yeah, yeah for okay. high school. They had it every year. Well, how do you get your kid into college? He has to have a transcript. So I'm sitting there going, okay, well, we did algebra when he was in seventh grade. So how am I going to put this down on his high school transcript? Mm -hmm. he did, I mean, because he'd finished algebra one, algebra two, and geometry before he went to high school. Mm -hmm. So what do I do with that? Yeah. So what I ended up doing, I got creative with my transcript. <laughs> and I did freshman classes. 
sophomore classes, junior classes, and senior classes. And then I just took every class he had and divided them up by where they were normally in a high school. Yeah. And then I just randomly put his college elective, you know, social sciences, psychology in a particular year because he only had 10 units of credit that year instead of 14. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was um, how to keep a transcript. That would have been useful information when I was like an eighth grade mom. Well, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Anybody listening to the show that may be considering this, something that they need to think about doing is keeping detailed records, apparently, of, of what they're going to do. So what about, okay, so if I'm someone that, is a single parent or if I'm in a parent of a home where both parents have to work, where one parent taking off and, and homeschooling their children is, is, we don't really have that luxury. What do I do then if I still want the benefits and the experience for my children of homeschooling? Um, well, there's a couple ways to go. One is send them to public school mm -hmm. and then make sure on the weekends or whenever you're not working mm -hmm. that you're doing the kinds of things you would have done as a homeschooler. Mm -hmm. They did a study, and if I'd have known you were going to ask that question, I'd have brought the study in, but they did a study, and they looked at poverty-level kids, middle-class-level kids, and um, rich kids, mm -hmm. and coming out of first grade, all the kids were on the same level. Oh. Going into second grade, the rich kids were way higher, mm -hmm. middle-class kids were still even with where they were, and the poverty kids had dropped, oh. because over the summer, nobody helped the poverty kids keep up. Over the summer, the middle-class kids did enough to keep up. And over the summer, the rich kids got additional lessons. Somebody interacted Enrichment. with them. Enrichment. Yeah. Okay? And, and that, they went through fifth grade with that. Mm -hmm. And by the end of fifth grade, the poverty kids were about at three and a half, third grade and a half. Mm -hmm. And the rich kids were about at eighth grade. Mm -hmm. Because of the difference in just in the summer mm -hmm. of them doing things like art camp or mm -hmm. science camp or drama camp or whatever. Something that would actually keep them stimulated through the summer as opposed to just sitting in front of the, the TV and right. playing video games or whatever it is kids do these days. Right. And so if you were a parent who could not homeschool, mm -hmm. then that's what I'd be looking at. I'd be looking at extracurricular stuff, not necessarily martial arts and sports, although those can be good, but things like in the summer mm -hmm. when the kid is going to be bored anyway, find art camp, science camp, math camp. And a lot of those camps do have scholarships for underprivileged, they do. underprivileged or special, special needs children. They do. And pretty much most, most people either would qualify for that or they could make the money for it. Mm -hmm. You could just say, we're not doing X, we're yeah, doing Y. Yeah, making it a priority. Right. And, and if you want to make it a priority, you can. Also, some people, and I really don't know how they do it, so I can't talk speak to this much. There are some single parents and dual working parents who still get their kids a homeschool education. Mm -hmm. I know that some parents who are homeschoolers homeschool kids that aren't their own. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who ended up homeschooling who homeschools her grandkids. I know a family who homeschools two children who are in poverty mm -hmm. from a single mother home. So there's possibilities there. There are also um, scholarships from the homeschool community hmm. that help homeschool parents financially so that they can homeschool. I don't know what those are because we just sucked it up and did it. Yeah, but, but a little bit of research, I'm sure, if there people are, could. There are those. And there are some people who work and still homeschool. Uh -huh. They leave their kids at home during the day, which you need to check on state laws for right. when that's legal. But they do their homeschooling in the evening. Mm -hmm. We send our kids to public school from 8 to 3, not because they need to be in school that long, but because that was the main time when people went to work in shifts in the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. So our kids go to school so that the parents can work. Yeah, it's daycare, essentially. And... If they don't need eight hours of school, then you can get it done in the evening. Yeah, and that's very true because the, the school that I went to was, unless you were one of the exceptionally bad kids, then for the most part, you were only there for three hours a day. The classes were, were very tailored individually. I mean, granted, this is 
this kind of schooling is not the norm and it's not something that's within most people's budgets. I was very fortunate in that sense. But that was all we needed. It was we got 30 minutes per class and 30 minutes of what was considered study hall. And if you were a good student, uh, you could actually do your work immediately after that class. And you were done. You had no, no homework, nothing to do. And so we only needed schooling three days a week. I mean, three days. That would have been nice. That would have been even more <laughs> nice. But it was only three hours a day that we actually needed schooling. And in most cases, most of us, again, unless you were one of the, the kids that was just being belligerent, in most cases, we were far ahead of our grade level. So, yeah, I think, thinking back on it, most of it was just kind of daycare for up until you're about 18 or until you finish high, high school at whatever age that is. And a lot of people don't get that. No. Because they don't, I mean, you think back to your school days. Do you really remember a lot about your classes? <laughs> or do you remember hanging out with your friends and chatting? Well, that's because that's most of what you did. Yeah, I think I remember the cute girls. That was, that was really the extent of, and, and the parties on the weekends. I think that was the extent of what I remember from, from uh, high school and such. And I think I mentioned this in the last podcast, but a veteran homeschooler told me when I started 30 minutes a day for, fresh, for kindergartners. Mm-hmm. Add 30 minutes per year and you're done. We did talk about that some last time, and that makes a lot of sense because that was, based on the schooling that I had, that was pretty much the same thing. I mean, you got, the school I went to didn't deal with children under, I want to say, what was it, about eighth grade or something. But for the most part, that was 30 minutes per class was all you got. And you were expected to get the information that you needed in that amount of time. And it was plenty of time because after, th- and the, the theory was more than 30 minutes and most children stop paying attention. Well, and that's true. Unless you have an exceptionally gifted speaker, a teacher that is an exceptionally give- gifted speaker and keep, can keep somebody else engaged for that long. Well, and even most, if you look into educational theory for college professors, they talk about eight to 10 minutes is the most anybody can pay attention. So you have to schedule your class so that every eight to 10 minutes you shift. Mm-hmm. So you have eight to 10 minutes of one thing, and then you go to group work, and then you go to something else, and then you go to reading, and then you go to... And so even in modern college, you're not doing everything for 45 minutes or an hour and 20 minutes. You're doing it in eight-minute segments. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting because that college professor would climb on a desk or swear very loudly about every eight minutes. So Actually, I think Amos was about every five minutes. (laughs) Some people argue for five, but eight to ten is normal. <laughs> yeah, the um, normal swear interval. Yeah. So what are some of the issues that, that homeschoolers run into just in the aspect of actually educating their children, not dealing with the outside world? I mean, what were, like, what were some of the stumbling and roadblocks that, that you ran across as a homeschooler? Well, the first one is most homeschoolers spend way too much money the first year or first two Oh, really? Years. Because you're like, oh, that's a cool book. Oh, I'd love <laughs> to teach my kids Mandarin Chinese. <laughs> oh, I really want to do three different art cur- curriculums because each one of these is amazing. Mm-hmm. And you end up, and you don't just go to one place because you're paranoid and you're afraid you're not going to get your kid a good education. And so you go to the conference and buy books there and you go to the school shop, the educate teacher education stores, and you buy stuff there and then you go to the hotels when they have the homeschooling book sales and you buy stuff there and then you end up with one year's worth of education for like seven years. Oh my God. And you can't use first grade education for seven years. You right. Know? And some of the books are just not as useful. Mm-hmm. And so the first year or two, you spend way too much money because you're scared mm-hmm. and you don't know what you're doing and you want to do the best and... It's kind of like buying survival gear. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually very much like your first year as a survivalist where you're like, I have to do everything. Yes. And it all has to be absolutely amazing, overbuilt. And, and also a lot of people buy books for things they're not going to make their kids do. Like the Mandarin like Chinese. Like the Mandarin Chinese. That, now, is that a personal experience where you were trying not to teach Not Mandarin Chinese. My son is learning Mandarin Chinese okay. now. That's why okay. I thought of it. I actually bought books for Spanish because oh, okay. I speak Spanish or I did at the time. Yeah. It's been so long ago. And here in Texas, that's, that's an applicable common, skill. That's a useful thing. And so I was like, oh. but I didn't actually teach them Spanish. I didn't feel confident in teaching them Spanish. The public schools weren't teaching Spanish. And so I wasted three years in a row. I bought Spanish books because <laughs> I'm going to do it this year, you know, and uh-huh. I didn't. I never did. Yeah. 
And one of my kids has taken Spanish and the other one has not and never probably will. So, mm. so um, it sounds like you really have to be, it sounds like getting a mentor for a lot of this stuff and actually getting involved in, in the local homeschooling community. Assuming there is a local homeschooling community. Okay, that, so like now there's Houston, an interesting question we're raising. Houston has several. Mm-hmm. Um, in Austin, the homeschooling community when we were there was very um, religiously oriented. Really? And my religious orientation was different from theirs, and okay. I was told I couldn't join. See, now that's very interesting. That's something They've I would... the rules. Okay, but that's still is something I would expect to hear from Dallas. And if you're not from Texas, this really isn't going to make a lot of sense to a lot of people, but... I guess the quick explanation is Dallas tends to be very conservative and religious, where and Austin tends to be hippie free love, I guess it, the most general way of putting it. And then Houston is considered kind of the sloppy somewhere in between. Big the personally, business. Big business. Conservative, yeah. politically. And so in Houston, there is no problem finding a group. Oh, wow. That's whatever. Neat. In Austin, I couldn't even join. That really shocks me because I would have expected to hear. I would well, have I expected to hear more from Austin, Austin, Dallas. Austin now. Oh, well, yeah, there are. Because okay. when I went to Maker Fair in Austin, there was a booth that was a homeschooling group do making robots that drew. But 14, I had never heard of them. Right. Yeah. But 14 so, years ago, the yeah. one group we could find out about would not accept us. That's so amazing. It varies. So it's, it varies. Yeah, it varies. And in Abilene, is, which is a small town in West Texas, 150 miles from anywhere or everywhere. <laughs> yeah, you guys like totally ran away from Houston. It's it's very yeah. sad. As far as I know, there is no homeschool group at all. In there Abilene? Homeschoolers. Okay. But there's no homeschool group. Well, I mean, are you really plugged found. into that community? I, I've talked to people who are homeschooling and they're trying to find hmm. one. So if they're there, please write the show, let me know. Well, see, now that raises another interesting thing and that's something that we've incorporated a lot into the show is if you don't have a community around you build a community around you and that in situations like that where you're you're in some place like Abilene where there definitely are homeschoolers I guess that's something where if it's if you want the community and it's certainly a community is always better than none to get together and start to try to form one and, and take that leadership role and get other people engaged and involved in it and I've uh, and there's you, also you could find a community online there are many of those yeah so. that's i mean there's a lot of if you're looking for a mentor you can probably you can find people who will answer your questions for sure mm-hmm. and they don't necessarily have to be there or for you to have met i when i moved to abilene i said that i homeschooled through college mm-hmm. my two sons and one of my coworkers came up and introduced himself and said do you mind if i give my wife your name because she's going to be homeschooling this year and oh wow I said, no, absolutely not. Give me her phone number, too. And she never called me, but I called her. Yeah. And we talked for about two hours. And I thought, okay, she'll call me. And she never did. And about three months later, I called her. And we talked for about yeah. two hours. And so, and then I needed to get rid of some of my old homeschool stuff. So yeah. I got about seven boxes of stuff and called her and said, mm-hmm. hey, can you use all this stuff? <laughs> yes, please. You know. So there are ways to make connections. Right? Yeah. And there's in the, in the day and age of Skype. And now there's what group Skype video calling where you can have a whole bunch of people on a call. And I mean, that's how we do this show when when people aren't physically able to come to the studio and actually record is we just use Skype and it works wonderfully. And I can imagine that's one of the beautiful things of the Internet, as you were talking about earlier, yeah. a few minutes ago, is that you can get online and, and reach out to communities online and connect with people. That's pretty interesting. What were some of the other stumbling blocks that you ran into? Well, I have one that was more related to my kids. Um, my oldest son is artistic. Mm-hmm. Artistic. Not autistic, artistic. Art. And he would, I mean, he would just flat out not do the work mm-hmm. if the book was not well designed, if the artwork <laughs> was shoddy. And, you know, you're thinking, okay, he's a little stubborn, you mm. know. But really, is it worth eight hours of my time to get him to do one lesson mm. because the book is not well drawn? And it's not even an art book? No. So after one or two books where, okay, this is the best I can, you know, this is the best stuff, Mm -hmm. but the art stinks, I quit spending my money on that. Yeah. Because it wasn't worth the struggle to get him to do it because aesthetically it was so displeasing that I used to say my hair hurt when I got it cut because I loved my hair and didn't Uh want it short. Well, it was kind of, an emotional hurt for him to look at 
pictures that weren't well drawn. That is probably unique, but it speaks more to the question of each child can very easily be an individual yes. and have individual needs. And while we look at it and go, the, the child is stubborn, it doesn't change the fact that that's going to be a massive roadblock, especially in that case, a massive roadblock for that child learning. And right. it's something that in your environment you can easily fix. Right. You can say, all right, fine, I'll go down to the store and buy a prettier book for you. Whereas in public school or, or even in most private schools, it would be tough luck, kid. This is our book. You're stuck. And I don't, I don't think that aesthetics, that design is something that most people think about. Mm. But according to Daniel Pink, um, aesthetics design is one of the things that's not going to be outsourced. Mm -hmm. So isn't that something you want your kids to be thinking about? Yeah. So when you're looking for books, maybe you should think, okay, is this nice looking? Mm -hmm. Is there a good amount of white space on the page? Are the colors eye-catching? Yeah. Um, do they make sense for the pictures? Do the pictures match the discussion? Mm -hmm. And things like that. If you pay attention to design, and it doesn't have to be major design, you can mm. look up document design for businesses and just start with that. Things like that will educate your child as you're going along. So your books will not only be teaching your child about math or science or art or history, it'll also be teaching them design. Mm -hmm. And they'll know that a page that has 90% black writing is not attractive. No, no, no. That's not uh, visually engaging. And, and that speaks to the point of uh, human beings, 90% of the way we take in the world is through vision, if I'm quoting that statistic correctly. But that's still, I mean, and that does speak. I mean, obviously, that, that was a, an instance where it was uh, an exaggerated, not that you're exaggerating, no, no, but, but it, yes, that is an exaggerated more... example. But, but that's still true. I mean, these, these things that, because I remember most of the, the books that we used when I was a kid, they were horrible, and yeah. I hated them. And, and granted, I have a, a lot of aesthetics are a large part of my, my working life, but still. Well, see, I came from the opposite end. Mm. I didn't have kid books because we were poor, mm. but my folks were in college. So I know what college books look like. Yeah. So like the first time I got a kid book, I was like, where are all the words? There's yeah. too many pictures. So that my, I was the opposite of my son. Mm -hmm. I wanted more words and less pictures. And yet it was really quickly, really quickly obvious that if I wanted him to do his work and do it well and happily, it needed to be designed well. Mm -hmm. And after that, it's just like, okay, that's what I need. I need a book that has the right information, enough information at the right level and is aesthetically pleasing. Mm -hmm. And all that does is make me not buy ugly books. Yeah. Which makes the next books look better because nobody's buying the ugly ones. That's true. So um, that was a stumbling block. Another one is the implication when you're homeschooling, your kids are bright, right? Your kids are always brilliant. Your kids are the of course. smartest kids on the planet. And of course, mine are. But <laughs> <laughs> um, sometimes they don't do things at the same time everyone else does. So one of my friends whose son was born a month before my oldest, said, oh, yes, I've taught my son to read using this book. And he was four. So I wanted to learn to read way before I got to learn to read. So I was like, okay, we're going to get the book. And we got the book. And I taught my son how to read, and he wouldn't read. And I got the book, and I taught my younger son how to read, and he couldn't do it. Mm. So all my friends are going, oh, my four-year-old's reading. My five-year-old's reading on a second-grade level. My six-year-old's reading on a ninth-grade level blah, 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 and I'm sitting there going, my six-year-old's not reading at all. My six-year-old's not reading at all. I'm a failure as a mother. Okay, and yet I'd seen the research because I'm really into research. I don't necessarily remember anybody's name, but I remember what I read. Mm -hmm. And there was a couple, both of whom were doctors, who did research on learning disabilities and their theory, with, which may, didn't seem to have a lot to back it up, but... It made sense. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't evidence-based necessarily, but made sense. Um, their theory was that every child who has the mental capacity, meaning they're not brain damaged, they're not blind, mm -hmm. uh, or the physical pet capacity as well, to learn to read, will learn to read by the time they're nine. Mm -hmm. But children have, every, everyone, humans all the way till you're ancient, have different brain connections that come into play at different times. And that if you try to force a five-year-old, which is when we now teach reading mm -hmm. in the public schools, to learn to read and their connections aren't there, 
they're far more likely to have learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know the study you're talking about. That study's been around for a long time and is very well respected from as far as I understand. And I have a sister with dyslexia, and mm -hmm. I did not want my children to have to struggle with that. So I didn't do it. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm crying in my pillow at night, but I'm not making my five-year-old read. I'm not making my six-year-old read. Okay, then how do you do school? Well, my youngest and I sat on the couch together, and I read him his history, and I read him his spelling. And I read him as math, art, drama. Mm -hmm. We acted out theater. Oh, they wrote poetry. Mm -hmm. So he wrote poetry in his head, and I would write it down, and we would look for rhyme words or whatever poems we were doing. How many syllables does that have out loud? And I did that until he was eight. And I just bit my tongue practically through when all the moms were going, yeah, my son's reading at such and such a level. My son's reading at such and such a level. Because my son wasn't reading at all. And he was about, well, he was eight years old, and he wanted to read Harry Potter, and he couldn't read. And I didn't really want to read 400 pages to him. And so I said, okay, you know, let's try some easier stuff so you can learn to read. And every year I dipped a little bit into trying to see if he could read or was up to that point or whatever. And when he was about eight and a half, he was ready. Mm -hmm. And in a year, he was reading at the 12th grade level. So at nine and a half, he was reading at the 12th grade level, and I tested him for that, so I know that. Yeah. And at eight and a half, he couldn't read at all. That was huge. That was my pride. Yeah. You know, and my fear. Oh, no, what if the government comes in? You know, thankfully, I was in Texas, so the government wasn't coming. But um, there are places where the government would come in and say, well, you're not teaching your child to read, so... Yeah. You're a bad teacher, so your kid has to go to public school. And I'm grateful that I wasn't there because he wouldn't have made it. He'd have been put in a special class. And at the time, he was the kind of kid that would have believed any label you put on him. That would not have worked. And yet he went to college as a sophomore because he'd already had a whole bunch of dual credit classes. Yeah. That same kid who didn't learn to read till he was eight and a half. Mm -hmm. So that's a struggle. The str a struggle when you're not good at something and your kid is, how do, you, how do you help them? How do you teach them? My oldest son is really good at math. We've already discussed how not really good at math I am. Yeah. And I was so pleased that we did well in Algebra 1 because I taught him Algebra 1 myself. But then I went, I can't teach you anymore because mm. that's all I know. So I found a math teacher at a math master, a master's in math education and she was willing to teach him, and so she, he, she, he learned geometry and algebra 2 from her, and he was signed up for trig, and she quit teaching. I was like, okay, mm. he's 14. I can't just let him have no math for the next four years. Right. So we went down to the local um, community college, and he tested out, and he tested into calculus. Mm -hmm. No trig, no pre-cal, straight into calculus. And he was like, all right. And I was like, no way. <laughs> and that was a stumbling block in terms of, Students often want to do what they can test into. Right. And yet I know two calculus professors who constantly are talking about the fact that they don't understand how kids get in their calculus classes who can't do the work. Yeah. And I wrote them after that and said, I know. I know how. They tested Here's how there. they get in there. Yeah. And I said, you're not going to be that kid. Mm. You're going to take trig. You're going to take pre-cal. Then you can take cal one, two, three, because the college had three. And, you know, then you can do whatever. And that's what he did. Mm. And he was like, Mom, it was easy. But then he'd come home a different day. Mom, I didn't understand any of that. I got to work on it. Mm. And so I couldn't teach him the math. But I found people who could teach him the math. Mm -hmm. And he's a math major. So that's a stumbling block is you not being good at something they're good at. Hmm. That's interesting. I think that's definitely one that I don't think most people would think of when, when your child excels in something that, that you're either not interested in not interested in enough to do or are just flat out no good at. Right. Would be like me trying to teach my kids to be spelling bee winners. It would just be <laughs> all kinds of wrong. I think there's a trick to that. <laughs> <laughs> they give you all the words, right? Yeah. Yeah, they give you a big book that has all the words. Yeah. So you just have to memorize 20,000 words and how they're spelled. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> no problem. Another thing is, it's not. I'm not sure it's a stumbling block, but how do you grade? Mm -hmm. Because... Kids want to know what grade they're in, first mm -hmm. of all, and then they want to know what their grade is. 
Why? Well, because all the other kids that they're going to school or scouts or soccer with are all talking about their grade and what their grades were. So you have to make a decision. Is their grade the school they're doing? Well, then which school is it? Yeah. Is it science? Is it math? Is it English? Is it art? Is it drama? Is it history? Is it grammar? Is it reading? Mm. There are a lot of choices. And if your kid is a normal kid, they won't be on the same level in all of them. Mm-hmm. Even if they're gifted, they're going to be on, in the third grade, age-wise, they're going to be on the sixth grade in one, and the seventh grade in one, and yeah. the fifth grade in one. Okay, so what are they in? Fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh grade? You know, no freaking way. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't really add up well for kids. No, and well, and it doesn't add up for the, parent, the people no, in the <laughs> store who are asking them how, what grade they're yeah. in, okay, which is where you get the most weird looks. Yeah. So we just decided that... And we talked to the kids about it and said, okay, you're in whatever grade your age is. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter what you're doing. If you, if you would be in second grade because your cutoff birthday missed, then you're in second grade. Mm-hmm. Yes, we're doing fourth grade work, too bad. But you're in second grade. And that made it easier for sports. Mm-hmm. It made it easier at church because they group them by age. Yeah. Then the kids knew a grade. You know, yes, they're doing 10th grade biology and they're in 7th grade, but they're in 7th grade. Right. So that's one. And then how do you grade your kid? Do you give them a test all the time? A lot of homeschoolers are like, I hate tests. I was bad at testing, so I don't want to give my kids tests. I get that. Mm. But your kids are going to have to take tests. They're going to have to take an SAT to get into college. Mm -hmm. Do you want the first test they take to be the SAT? (laughs) No way. Okay. So... A lot of curriculum has tests with it. Mm-hmm. And I will say that one family I know did not realize this, but the kids would go in and pull the answers out. Yeah, I might have done that once and, or twice in um, high school. Then they would write down the answers with one or two wrong, depending on how. Yeah, because how, they were actually clever yes, kids. Yes, and then they would put it back. Yeah. And so they always had A's on the test, even if they hadn't <laughs> read the book. Okay. Yeah. And I was sure that was not going to happen with my kids because I wasn't going to do that. Right. Okay. One of my friends who's still homeschooling writes all her exams. So she knows the answers, but the kids don't, and they're not written down, so Mm. they can't find them. For me, I was like, I don't really want to give a lot of tests. I want them to learn the material. And I know, because I've taught every grade from kindergarten to grad school and college, that people learn things for tests, and then they kick them out of their brain like Mm -hmm. it's trash. And I didn't want that. So I made my kids do their work to mastery which means they had to make 100 on any anything they did. Mm-hmm. So if they did a math sheet and they got a 92, they had to do the math sheet over until they had 100. Mm-hmm. If they did an essay and they got a B, they had to write the essay over till they got an A. Mm-hmm. I didn't make them do 100 on an essay, okay? But it had to be yeah. all spelled. It had to follow all the directions. It had to meet every criteria that was listed. And so my kids had to do a lot of work that they wouldn't have to do if they were in public school. Because mm-hmm. a 92, who's going to make a kid do a 92 over Yeah, again? no, all they want you to do is pass. Pass, right. If you can pass, great. And a lot of schools won't let you flunk. So a C is good, you know? And mm. so, okay, well, I'm not going to do that. I don't want great inflation. Because mm. a lot of, te- I mean, you do. Your kid's brilliant. You love them. You know <laughs> how hard they worked, you know? Yeah. You want to give them all A's. Is it legitimate? Well, then when I'm doing the transcript, mm. My kid made a hundred on everything. Isn't that an A plus? Well, yeah, but he didn't make a hundred on everything the first time. Yeah. Okay. So what do I do with that? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you determine what the grade average is? And that was a stumbling block because I'm like, okay, I want to be fair. Yeah. I want to be accurate. I want to be truthful. And I don't want to kill my kids' options. Right. What does that mean? That wasn't something that I, anybody ever told me about or... Mm shared with me how they figured it out. I just got in the middle and went, oh, crumb, I have to do something with this. <laughs> how am I going to do that? Yeah. So grading is a stumbling block in terms of what grade they're in, grading in terms of how are you going to grade them. Mm-hmm. And testing can be a stumbling block. Now, in some states, you have to test. Mm-hmm. They have to take a state test or they have to take a national test or they have to take whatever. I didn't actually test my kids until both my kids could read. Mm -hmm. So my oldest was 10 and my youngest was 9 before they got any testing. And then we did one national test a year. The first year they did their grade level. 
And my oldest was 11 years old, 10 years old. So that would have been fourth grade, fifth grade, fourth grade, maybe third. And he tested it 11th and 12th for third grade stuff. Mm. And I was like, okay, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So the next year he did fifth grade. Mm -hmm. And he still did really well. So the next year, I jumped him another grade. And then after that, he just took those tests. So on his transcript, along with the class grades, which he had 72 hours of college. So there was plenty this college could see. But I also had his ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, and 12th grade national exams, Mm -hmm. scores, and the years he took them when he was 12, 13, Mm. 14, and 15, (laughs) okay? So, you know, I I was able to say, look, he can do this, Mm -hmm. obviously. My kids are not poor test takers. I'm a really good test taker. I always intended to give them exams, just not a lot of them, Mm -hmm. because I didn't want them to learn to the test. Right, just enough to, it sounds like, just enough to actually measure to make sure that, and to have stuff for the future right. when you're talking to colleges to say, look, right. yes, I really did test my children. Yes, Here's they really did they make really A's. Did do this. Yes. Yeah. And that's an issue because, and it's an issue with colleges because what's an A at one school? Yeah. Is it an A at another school? Especially if it's being graded on a curve and you're competing with the other in children. Your class, in class. Yeah. And, you know, and so there's often issues with grading, not just in homeschooling, mm-hmm. but also keeping grade reports if it's not required by your state. Okay, well, what do I need to do? Well, once you're hitting high school level stuff, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. or high school age, whether they're in high school stuff or not, then you need to start keeping grade reports. And this sounds like a good point at which to to segue into much latter end of the the show, which is how do you stay motivated as a parent for all those years to stay this into your child's life, especially when we've got a society today where it's like we started the show with ship your kids happy little butts off to school in the mornings in a yellow bus, taking that much responsibility. How do you stay that motivated and focused? Well, I knew going in it was going to be that much. That's why my son went to private school first grade. <laughs> yeah. Because I was like, I don't want to do this for 12 years. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of work. This is a, a lot, lot of work. work. I, I don't want to do that. I don't think I can. I don't yeah. know how. I, don't, I, 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 I mean, I was terrified. His first grade year was so crummy that I decided there was nothing I could do that was worse. <laughs> and um, so I didn't send them anywhere after that, mm-hmm. except college. There were a couple of years where I was like, I don't ever want to do this again. I don't care if they fail when they go. They need to go to public school. I'm sick of this. Mm-hmm. I'm sick of fighting. I'm sick of, and, it, and it, not fighting like yelling, screaming. No, whatever, but normal but, parent but child. But trying to get, because yeah. you're not just the mom. You're the mom and the teacher mm-hmm. and the principal and, you know, anybody else, the truancy officer, <laughs> okay? <laughs> That's a lot of hats and you look like the same person, yeah. you know? So how do you deal with that? And the cafeteria lady. And the cafeteria lady, the hall monitor, you know, just everything. Yeah. Whenever it got really, really bad where I just was like, I don't care, I can't do anything, they need to go to college. I mean, they need to go to school just so I don't kill them, yeah. you know? I would just go, okay, and then I would start planning what they had to do to go to school. And then I would think about what their experience was going to be like going to school. Yeah. And then I would back off. <laughs> <laughs> because can you imagine my 11th grade, my 11-year-old who's already done Algebra 2 going to 6th grade? Yeah. You know, no way. Mm-hmm. Um, or my very, very, I thought, social younger son going to a class where he has to sit down and not say anything. He has to sit down. First mm-hmm. of all, that would have been a problem. And he has to not say anything mm-hmm. for eight hours. Yeah, no, it's not going to work. And as my husband reminded me when we started, there's one of you and two of them. When will they ever get a better teacher-student ratio? And who will care more about their education? There are plenty of things I did wrong. Mm-hmm. There are plenty of things I want to go hide under the covers right now thinking about, you know? <laughs> Um, there are plenty of things I wish I had done better. Mm-hmm. Even at the time, some of those things, I was like, oh, I should be doing this. And I just could not. I was doing all I could do. My kids are well educated. They know I love them. Mm-hmm. They know I put my career on hold for them. Mm-hmm. They know I stayed home with them. <laughs> my kids know 
that they were my priority. Yeah. They don't want to homeschool right now. Yeah. They don't want to ever, you know, do that to their kids. Yeah. But yeah, because that's some Jewish mother level guilt right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they know that they were important. Yeah. And their education was important to me. Mm -hmm. What could be more important than that right there? Some days, peace, quiet, <laughs> an empty house, a clean a house. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. There are some days when something else. And one thing that helped both them and me mm -hmm. was when I realized that those stupid six weeks at the beginning of school every year when they repeated everything you learned last year and that was boring me out of my school yeah. is actually needed for lots of kids, including mine. Uh -huh. And so we stopped having school from September 1 to May 31st. Uh -huh. And we started having school all year long. Yeah. Well, then when I got so ready to scream uh -huh. that if they'd have just sat down and looked at me, I might have, then we didn't have school. Yeah. Okay, here's a book. You're going to do literature today, and that's it. Yeah. Get out of my hair. Yes. And I could do that because we were doing school all year long. Yeah. We weren't just doing 180 days. Yeah. Well, Ron, Suanna, I want to thank you guys for part two. This has been, we've definitely dug a lot deeper into some, some of the more complicated topics than we did last time. And I think this is a, a great follow-up show. Maybe one day we'll even get around to a, a three. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. We got a lot in today. But I want to thank y'all again for showing up. I really appreciate it. And it's good to see y'all smiling faces since y'all abandoned us uh, <laughs> and moved off to Abilene. And uh, just thanks again for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Show notes, resources, and links for this episode are available by going to intherabbithole.com slash E187. Support the show. Visit ITRH.net to find out about Armada membership benefits. Again, that's itrh.net to keep the show safe and sound that helps keep you safe and sound. And with that, we wrap up episode number 187 from the Lone Star State. Till next time, stay safe and sound. Okay.